Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are going to look at Kenya today and specifically a very special part of Kenya, you know, down between Savu, Ambuseli and Kilimanjaro in the southeastern part of the country. Now, I first, thinking back, I can remember meeting Luca about 20 years ago. I uh, was working for a small operator in California and in came this guy with his newish project still in Kenya. And, you know, he just had the passion and the fire in his eyes. And he was telling us about this magical part of Africa, the cloud forest, the plains, the wildlife, the views of Kili. And what he really talked about and what really drove him was in the communities and the conservation challenges that they faced. So fast forward a couple of years later, you know, I finally get a chance to visit uh, Kampi and the Chulus. And I was captivated from the moment we fly into that airstrip and nestled in the foothills of the Chulus. It's just one of the most beautiful views in the world. And to this day, I mean, walking up in those, you know, green cloud forests is unlike any other safari experience that you typically have anywhere in Africa. And I just love coming out of the forest onto a ridge line and you can see all the way over Savu on the one side. On the other side, the plains go all the way down to Amboseli. You know, Kili is in the background. I mean, it's such a special place. You realize why that needs to be protected. You kind of realize why Hemingway called this the Green Hills of Africa. And then today, you know, Luca, you know, he still has that passion and that fire in his eyes. And today, Kampi Yakanzi and the Maasai Wilderness Conservation Trust it's just one of the one of the leading one of the best examples and the most successful uh, community-based ecotourism projects that you can find anywhere in Africa and it's always special to be a part of that and I'm so glad we can talk to to them today about it so with that I'm going to hand you over to Claudia Lenoy and Luca to tell you a little bit more about what's going on at Campi where, about the trust and also about the exciting future of this area. So with that, over to you, Claudia, and looking forward to hearing. Thank you, Johan. And uh, I guess good, good morning to you from uh, your part of the world. It's good evening for us. Um, Johan, you've already mentioned uh, briefly where um, in uh, the country we are located. So I will quickly take everyone um, on the map. As you probably have it from your side, um, where we operate both as Kampiya Kandi and Masa Wilderness Conservation Trust is located between two major national parks. That is Savo National Park, the biggest in the country, and Amoseli right here. And in Kuku, that is in uh, some shade of yellow, that is where we operate. Um, the land is as big as 283,000 acres, excuse me, um, and it's outlined or contained in uh, the blue margins that um, are depicted in uh, the satellite image that you have. And that is the famous, this is the famous Akili, and we are probably just at the foothills. And just in the back are the Chulu Hills and uh, the Savo National Park. And uh, you know, with the onset of the pandemic, we've had to take uh, certain measures uh, that have been advised by the government. And uh, we've uh, sent uh, some of our staff home as a measure to combat uh, the pandemic, um, uh, specifically the social distancing advice. And, uh, um, you know, with that, it's not uh, been one of the easiest decisions to make, uh, but we have uh, to do, um, we have to make the decisions to get us to the pandemic. And unfortunately, we've had to slash, you know, more salaries of all employees. And hopefully this can carry us until we can regain to normalcy and, uh, you know, reinstate all salaries. Um, excuse me. One other project that has been highly impacted uh, for the lack of tourism as uh, most um, agents that have tuned in or guests that have tuned in uh, are uh, um, looking at is a program that we call Campia, um, excuse me, Wildlife Base. 
and uh, um, it literally means what it says. So for every night that our guest stays at Camp Yakanzi, there's a charge of hundred dollars that goes towards compensating the Maasai for uh, their losses to predators. As most of you might know, the Maasai is a pastoral community um, that you know coexists day in day day out with the predators. And that comes with the consequences of uh, uh, predation every other day. We have an average of four to five uh, um, predations per day. And uh, for us to ask, we've in the past been successful in asking the Maasai to tolerate these um, losses. Um, but with unprecedented, unprecedented times, it's going to be difficult to you know, ask them to live with those losses. Uh, we've been so lucky to have uh, uh, or to get a donation that is hopefully going to carry us through this period until at a time um, Luca knows best when we can, uh, um, you know, go back to normalcy and uh, hopefully um, continue with the future of uh, uh, this program. Having said that, we have uh, over the years have seen the success of the program where uh, our predator numbers have reached you know, the maximum carrying capacity. Lions, for instance, has been a success story in this part of, um, in this part of Kenya, where our lions have even gone beyond, um, you know, the boundaries of uh, the Kuku Group Ranch to repopulate uh, the neighboring national park, Savo National Park, all the way to Amboseli National Park. So, you know, on behalf of the guests that we've been having, on behalf of tourism that has been uh, um, quite success successful in this part of the country, we've been able to revive uh, the, um, the numbers of these predators. And uh, we hope that we can, you know, um, keep doing this in the future. So, I don't know, Lenoy, what do you think about this? Okay, thank you, Claudia. And as you and had introduced us before, I'm Lenoy working with the Maasai Wilderness Conservation Trust, heading the livelihoods department. And uh, our role is basically to empower the local Maasai women in Kuku Group Ranch through uh, sustainable projects. One of them being the beadwork. We also have grassy banks, the honey project, and the hip roller. On the beadwork, we train the women on how to improve the quality. And Cambia Kanzi has been buying these beads on behalf of the community and giving the beads as present to the guests who have been visiting Cambia Kanzi. And with this pandemic, this has really been affected because now we cannot sell these beads on behalf of the women. The other project is beekeeping. This one has also been affected by the pandemic. And we are not only doing this to improve the living standard of the women, we are also doing this to mitigate the human wildlife conflict. And we have also been selling the honey on behalf of the local women through the guests who have been visiting Cambia Kanzi. The other project is the grass seed bank. This one has not been affected directly by the pandemic, but it has always been good seeing people from outside coming to Kenya and in Kuku Group Ranch, seeing the local Maasai women in the forefront of conservation and protecting their land for the current and for the future generation. And through these many visits, we have also been receiving generous guests who have donated hippo rollers that has eased the fetching of water for the women. The carrying capacity is higher, that is 90 liters. Before the hippo rollers, they used to carry 20 liters on their back. Fantastic, well done. Uh, Claudia, what is, it, what is up with you at Cambia Kanzi for now? Oh gosh. Um, you know, we might have reduced uh, the number of staff we have at Kanzi, but for some reason we are busier than ever. We have uh, been, uh, you know, trotting through the savannah, trying to map out new routes for, you know, the future um, tourism when and if it's revived. Uh, look at the optimist thinks this is go we're going to get through this, <laughs> but I'll let him um, talk us through that in a second. Um, Luca has been all over with the boys. Luckily, I've been, uh, I've been lucky enough to join them on one of um, the camping trips. We have had of, oh, more like we've had, um, 
our rangers have spotted spores of uh, a mama rhino and her baby. So Luca has been camping out day in, day out, uh, trying to find uh, this rhino, which is quite exciting. And uh, this is, you know, a video from the other day when they went out camping. Um, so yeah, with that, Luca, how do you feel about the future though? So we wanted to give you an idea of what is being happening in the last two months. And thank you, ladies, you've really done a great job. And for me, it's more looking what to expect for the future. And sometimes it's good to look back. When I look at this image and I look at Kilimanjaro full of snow, I think of the great, great grandmother of Samson who told me before dying uh, in 2007, and she was already uh, older than 100 years old. Um, she remembers a young girl how the snow was at the saddle throughout the year. Now it only happens when there is a snowstorm. I think that, I hope, that people after this pandemic will feel that climate change is an issue that we need to tackle, that we need to live in harmony with nature. And that's what we are thinking here at Campi Akanzi. Um, like you have read, I'm sure, uh, you know, in the Channel of Venice, you see fish and you see dolphins. Nature is obviously benefiting out of human retreating to their homes. Uh, even here at Campia Kanzi, we have work dogs right outside the office. We have the giraffe next to the tents because with less guest occupying, the animals are coming closer and closer. But I think for me, it's inspiring that the new safari industry, I think, will be more interested in nature, in true wilderness, and perhaps less interested in, you know, pillow menus and those kind of things that do not really belong to the safari experience in my uh, way of thinking. We are going to do Campia Kanzi. We're going to build a new lodge. We are experimenting with an electric Land Rover and we were pioneer of solar 20 years ago and we will go to the extreme we will have induction kitchen and we believe that is the product that people will want and they will seek and for us like Johan said right at the beginning it's all about community and i think for the guests being connected with the maasai in such an iconic land would be incredible and going up to the cloud forest look how dwarf we are uh, by this enormous fig tree that's what we think the future will be. I think that people will want to um, have a, a more genuine experience and we have always been about that and we are ready to be positioned for that. Um, like Claudia mentioned, we have um, a carbon neutrality project. So as Campia Kanzi, we have been carbon neutral for two years and I think people will be more interested. What it means is that we were offsetting not only our carbon footprint here, but even flying in and flying out our guest. Let me take you for two minutes into the heart of the cloud forest and explain you what we are doing with Maasai Wilderness Conservation Trust and how this can be linked to tourism where you can travel carbon neutral.
I know I just made a lot of people jealous. Sorry about that, <laughs> but that's where we live. We are very lucky and we hope you will be very soon here. So just a few words about that carbon project. We cover 1 million acre and I think it's very important in this pandemic that money are coming through. We just gave nine grants of $100,000 each to the nine participants. We are the carbon office. And Kenya Wildlife Service received a very important grant of 100,000. You can imagine how even the national parks without tourists has been impacted. And so I think that's where Johan and I uh, connected 20 years ago, this idea of looking nature at nature to pay conservation dividends. And I really, really think that that will be the future of the safari industry. So Jan, I think we will hand it back to you. And here we are waiting for you coming soon. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that with us, Luca. I really, really appreciate it. And, you know, it, it's so important, these projects and what we do there, because it is really the only way that, you know, communities in rural areas can partake in the world economy. And what you and other visionaries have helped the communities achieve is just so special because that's the future of Africa, you know, the future of conservation. If it doesn't allow communities to, com to compete in the world economy or get their little crumbs of the pie of the world economy, it's, you know, not gonna work. So thank you so much for what you've been doing there. And I've got a couple of questions who, that came in uh, some more practical. Uh, is there malaria in the area? Um, no, there isn't, meaning that we are too high and the temperature is too low. We are at 4,000 feet and it goes below 14 degrees in June, July. And that kills the Anopheles mosquito that gives malaria. So luckily, um, I have raised my three children here. They are now 17, 13, and 11. And uh, it was obviously a comfort thing that there was no malaria. It was less comforting thinking about the lions when they were walking to the school, that that's a different story. <laughs> the, the, the joys of living in the bush, or so to speak, or living in a wildlife area. Another question, and I think you part answered that already, is you know whether the area is good for families. And I think with it being malaria-free and Luca even raising his family out there, uh, we really do know how to look after families as it is. But a, a question that ties into that is the ideal number of nights to spend in the area. So, Yes, it is fantastic to have families here. Um, we have always enjoyed it and the Maasai are incredible with the kids and we have a Maasai kids program and Lano is already nodding and she loves having her children going visiting her projects. I think it's funny, I I'll answer you in a different way. I had guests who came four times and each time they were staying longer. So they were a couple, so I don't think the guy had an affair with my wife, he was coming for real and he stayed 17 days, the, the, the fourth visit. So <laughs> joking aside, I think you can stay easily four nights and uh, do something different every day. Sometimes a way to save on money is to keep people in a place that is diverse enough that you can move around without needing a new air transfer. So if you stay a week at Camp Yakanzi and you go and visit Tsavo one day and you go and visit Amboseli another day, you really explore all of the southern eastern area of Kenya, staying in one lodge and cutting down air transfer costs. Great, thank you for answering that so uh, well. Another question is, are there any, since we are so close to the Maasai community and so integrated with that, are there any interesting cultural activities that a guest to the area can experience? I'll let Lanoi telling you all about it. Sorry, can you please repeat the question? Uh, any interesting cultural activities uh, for people interested in learning more about the Maasai culture that we can offer to guests? Yeah, for sure. We have a lot of uh, traditional and cultural practices that other people could like to learn, like uh, working with the Morans, beadwork, stories from the old women and old men. Yeah. 
I think that's what we, mo we miss most. So the Maasai have not been badly affected so far. Uh, luckily, there are no cases in our area. But I think for Lanoi, she is so proud of having empowered women in the community and not having guests coming and interacting with her. She misses it. Yeah, you, for you sure. Do. Yeah, I do. And, and for me, that's always been one of the reasons I like to put, you know, a visit to Kampi at the end of a trip, you know, like, firstly, especially for a first time visitor, take all your pictures in, you know, of the lion right, lying right next to you in the Mara. Um, then come here and get out of the vehicle. I mean, it's, it's a wilder area. So yes, we have as many lions as the land can carry, but you probably see them a little bit further away. And the access to the communities. I mean, most other places in East Africa, if you visit a community, it's quite often, I mean, you could be the 10th vehicle that day and, you know, people are about as excited to see you as, you know, someone in 7-Eleven is when you pick up milk in the evening or something. You know, it's just not a, a real experience. And to me, that has been one of the most special things about the, the area and Kampi as well, that, you know, quite often someone from the lodge will take you to meet their family and show you the tree he climbed in as a kid and, you know, where he grew up and where his brother is. And that's my cattle and that's, you know, my family. Uh, it's very real. I mean, it's not a touristic experience. And woven into that, seeing the, the, the projects that the, the trust is seeing and, and seeing all of that firsthand, it is definitely a special way to end the trip. And it's always lovely to see people repeating, you know, like it's always the, it's, it's, it's a test for any area camp hospitality. If people come once, do they return? Do they keep coming back? And, you know, that's a really good testament to you. Also a question about what other activities beyond community visits and animal viewing are on offer in that area. Um, you know, flying to different things or maybe visiting neighboring parks as well, something like that. So we operate commercially our own airplane, which is based here. So you can do scenic flight over at Savo to Mzima Spring. Of course, the Kilimanjaro scenic flight is an incredible one. And I can see a question from my friend Bill that did a Kili flight with me. He was asking when do we think that we will have the next guest. I hope September, if not earlier. And um, so horseback riding, visiting Savo, visiting Ambuseli, flying. I would say those are the main activities. We can do a fly camp and just put a very simple camp out and camp out. I love doing that. I've done that again with repeating clients. It's interesting that when people come and stay longer, they want to do more stuff. Uh, a question that came in is how far a drive is it to Savu? You know, can we visit Savu West from where you are? Yes. Um, you might remember from the map that Claudia showed, um, they, she was talking about Savo. Savo is exactly where we are. We are surrounded by it. So it actually takes no time, meaning that this, it's a gain drive throughout. You're not moving to Savo. You're moving towards Savo in the wilderness. And you're having a gain drive while you're doing that. So it will take about 40 minutes to reach the boundary with Savo. We spend the day there, we take a picnic, and our record is going to Tsavo in terms of species of mammal sense. So I was seeing the questions about the big five. I would say that the big five is, is limitative. It, it, we're not about the big five. We are about the big everything. So in that safari, we saw 33 different species of mammals. I'm, and I'm not counting the small ones. We're talking about Kleespringer, Oryx, Waterbuck, Garanook, Lesser Kudu, uh, etc and all the ones that you can imagine but can you think of seeing 33 big mammals in one safari it's incredible and you go from shaitani lava flow that is only 200 years old to land that is 2 billion years old uh, 600 million years ago here was the south pole and you see all these incredible geology just in that drive i think savo is undersold I think Savo, unfortunately, is, has been used, Savo East, for mass touring from the coast, and it's a jewel. I think Savo is a fantastic, undiscovered land that you can explore when you stay with us. 
Fantastic. Yeah, I did. I was lucky enough on a longer stay the last time I was there to do a day trip into Sava West. And as Luca said, I mean, it is fascinating to the landscapes and the sheer number of elephants, you know, covered in red dust, you know, looking unlike any other elephants that you find in, you know, Botswana, South Africa, or even the rest of Kenya. A uh, quick question about uh, whether we, uh, someone can experience Maasai cuisine as well. And Claudia, I think we do serve that at the lodge typically, together with some fantastic Italian influenced food. I mean, best food in Africa, in my opinion. Only Dracula would love Maasai cuisine because it's blood and milk. <laughs> Maybe it's I think so. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm saying maybe it's modern Maasai cuisine, you know, Maasai meat, <laughs> Italian meats, Western. <laughs> I think if anyone is open to drinking blada, the Dracula, that is all welcome. Um, but going back to your question, we do not specifically offer like Maasai cuisine. If something, if someone wants them to, you know, to have a, a taste of a, something that is very traditional, cultural to Maasai, then we make plans for it. Having said that, we spend a day out of the days that our guests usually are here and uh, prepare more Kenyan cuisine uh, that is uh, from all over the country. So a sample from uh, the Kikuyu, a sample from the Kisi, a sample from uh, the Maasai, a sample from uh, the coast of Kenya. So uh, more like sampling from all over the country to bring um, to the table these uh, thing we call the Kenyan cuisine. So. That is more awful than the specifically the blood uh, on the menu, for sure. Fantastic, thank you. Or, or, or may, maybe it comes down to something like Bloody Marys or something that represent the Maasai side, something along those lines. Uh, two quick questions on Savu that came in, whether uh, it's possible to visit the local rhino sanctuary in Savu and uh, Luca mentioning Jeronuk in Savu, uh, do they also have any gravy zebra in Sabu? That's a very good question and the answer is yes and let me explain why we have gravy zebra. Um, I was lucky enough to be here with the friend of mine who actually released them in the 70s. Um, his name was Julian McKinn, he was a very very close friend of mine. He was a friend of William Alden and uh, he built the Mount Kenya Safari Club uh, for him and with him. And Julian uh, was here for 14 years every Christmas with me and I miss him. It was an inspiring uh, character. Anyway, going back to the gravy zebra, it was Julian in the 70s releasing them. There were conservation issues up in the north and they thought that they could do well here. They have survived and I have seen them, but they don't belong here. So uh, originally they are from the northern part of Kenya. Uh, we do have the Garanook, we do have an Oryx that is different from the one in the north, so Oryx Bazard and Frigid Irid Oryx, we have that. And uh, I think there was another question about the big five. Yes, there are the big five, but as I said, I think it's more about everything else and not just uh, this idea of going out. So these five species, that, that big five thing is more of the hunting days to me than anything else. There was a lot of excitement about the rhino you mentioned earlier, and uh, maybe that's the next phase. I mean, they are still very rare and not regularly seen. And that's the next phase of conservation. Maybe when we have this talk in whatever format in 10 years or 20 years, you know, it's, you know, the next success story. And again, that's kind of like what I mentioned earlier, too, is when you put a trip together in Kenya, I actually personally like to you know, go up north to Laikipia and, you know, see the gravies there. There's, you know, an abundance of them at many of the, the, the really good projects up there. Um, see the species up there, go to the Mara. I mean, the Mara is grassland. You can drive, you know, fairly easily off-road. So you're always, and there's lots of vehicles, lots of people. So there's, you're going to see the animals up close. And that's fine, but you're also not going to have that wildness, the, the, the wilderness, a true wilderness experience. Very few pockets in the Mara that can offer that. Um, there are a few, but few and far between. And then you come to Kampi and then get out of that vehicle, walk in the cloud forest, go visit the community, 
and you'll see lots of wildlife along the way. Yes. It's just a volcanic landscape. Sometimes you can't drive off road when it's too rocky or something like that. Yeah. But that sense and of wildness is, you know, unlike what you're going to find in more regular, you know, sort of mass market safari areas. Um, to me, that's, that's been a big part of the experience. And I see a question of whether the caves are still a part of the experience. That's another thing you can't, uh, I've never experienced anywhere else in Africa over the years of travel there. Yes, it is. But let me go back because I did an answer about the rhino and uh, you just say things that are, I think, very important and very dear to me. So yes, uh, you can go and visit the rhino sanctuary in Tsavo. Um, but I think it's about what you just said. So nothing wrong in wanting to go and see the big five and nothing wrong in wanting to have that kind of full wildlife experience. If that's what you seek, don't come here go into South Africa, man-made, fenced area, you go in and you have, a, for me, a zoo safari experience, and maybe some guest wants to do that. You have a truck uh, with a car and a radio and say, hey, come in because the car just before you or after you saw a leopard and you feel excited about seeing it. Here is the opposite. When we go to Tsavo and we see rhino, it's one of, I think it's the only one, I'm not sure, but you can check that you want, but it's the only place in Kenya where you can see rhinos outside of a rhino sentry. In the map that Claudia was showing, the greener area in the middle of Tsavo, the intense protection zone, has now 100 rhinos outside of it. And last time we were there, we saw mating rhinos in the wild, in the, you know, 8,000 square mile of Tsavo. Where do you get that? Nowhere. So here you come to the real Africa and you have the real African experience, um, including the cave dinner. <laughs> that is definitely still there. But it's pretty unique to be in such an incredible wilderness with no vehicles and see a rhino in the wild. No guarantees, but can you imagine if you see a rhino that is not, you know, next to other vehicles and in a small fenced area, it's, it's unique. It's, it's, it's what it was a hundred years ago and what got people excited about safari in the first place. Is now, the wild. Now there's something about wildness and about actually tracking animals and looking for them and you know not just bumping into them all the time. I mean there's a time and place for everything but that is one of the, the sort of essences of a safari as well. A uh, question of can we do walks? Yes definitely. I mean fantastic walks to sundown or spots on those beautiful uh, round little copies gorgeous views of Kili as the sun sets. I mean, I've got a lot of photos around my house about that. Um, the same with obviously walking up in the cloud forest that I mentioned as well. And then the horse riding, uh, what level do you offer there, Luca? You need to be an experienced rider because we have lions and buffaloes. If people are not very experienced, we can ride within the compound of the camp, but to go out with the uh, wildlife, you definitely need a good rider. Um, I saw a question that I would like to answer, which is what about activities that are related to the trust uh, in terms of like tracking rhinos and things. We have a number of uh, safaris that are completely linked to the trust. You can come and do a game count with me and uh, you, we do an aerial count, we go flying and it's an incredible experience. Uh, we can go out with the Simba Scouts and track lions on foot, and we can do another number of things that are completely related to the conservation programs, as well as other programs that the law is involved with. Okay, I've also a question about the fly camp, and if you can tell us a little bit more about that. I'll let Claudia tell you about that. Uh, so this idea was born, I guess, again, out of uh, the old uh, school um, kind of safari where it was a basic needs only. So basically a fly tent with uh, the most basic needs that you would need. Uh, I mean, you would uh, require with a fire outside of uh, uh, the tent. And uh, that is what we try to do. So the place where we have a fly camp is uh, um, Hemingway's you know, place of hunting back in the days when that was a thing. Um, so basically, we it needs to be an activity that is planned way before our guests get to camp because it uh, it takes uh, quite uh, some uh, time to organize. And uh, we fly the guests there 
after in the in the afternoon at three o'clock four o'clock and uh, um it's very basic tents with uh, you will have your food you'll have your bucket showers uh you will have your outside toilets and uh then uh, we go for walks along uh, the mokoina river or river with uh, plenty of uh, the yellow fever acacias um then we uh, meet uh, by the fireplace uh, for sunset drinks as we call them in Kenya, uh, with a different uh, reference. And uh, um, that is basically it uh, for the evening. And then in the morning, we have other walks to track elephants. It's usually Luca with a gun, which is a good thing. Um, so um, just would go out for a walk um, in the morning, again, along the river, um, and uh, back for breakfast, and uh, flight back to camp in the mid-morning. Yon, I saw a question from my friend Patawari. She sits on, on the board of the trust and I would like to answer. And she was asking, uh, how do you see tourism campi post COVID-19? And how do you feel that the experience will be enriched as a result of the pandemic? How would you interest Kenyans, East Africans and other Africans to come and experience the majesty of campi? But thank you for that question. It's very important to me. Um, imagine the gorilla experience and how that permit cost a fortune and it's difficult for Africans to afford it for the average Kenyan, right? I think it's a very good point there because with the new lodge and somebody was asking more information about it and I'll share it in a minute, but we will definitely cost more. We are aiming to be at the very top of the market, but we will have African rates. African rates means African citizen rates. I do not have resident rates. I do not like the idea that somebody is, that is sitting in Nairobi and earning massive salaries working for the UN or for an embassy of whatever, they even want to pay less than the visitor coming from New York. So I've never had resident rates, but we will have African rates. If you are a citizen of every African nation, you will come and experience the new lodge and touch first and these efforts for conservation. I think if we want Africa to be protected, it needs to be done for and with Africans and having African visitors is very, very important to me, very important. And about the post COVID, I think I said it at the beginning part, I really think that people will look for a product that is generally connected with the wilderness, with the people and with the wildlife that one will visit. And without being arrogant, I think we are very well positioned for that. Fantastic. And you mentioned, uh, you know, a couple of questions came in on the new lodge and the size of it and, you know, uh, timelines on that. I don't know how much of that you can share. Uh, you want to address that? Um, as you can imagine, we are just thinking how to go about it. So yes, we're going to rebuild Campia Kanzi. We have already found a fantastic site. We know that we will be completely solar. By that, I mean that we are already 100% solar here, but not with our kitchen. And we will have induction kitchen. Inductions are the magnetic electric. So we will be carbon neutral, not because we offset our uh, emission, but because we will have no emissions, which is incredible. Um, we are deciding about the size, we are deciding, we have already a draft of the design, and we are deciding about the timeline, simply because we know that tourism will be back, and we want to respect the social distancing that Kenya is now having as rules. So I would love to start building in two months, but I cannot do that until the social distancing regulations uh, have changed. So we are at the window and we will have an announcement that Johan and I will do very soon, as soon as we make clear decisions. Yeah, and in, in, in this time of uncertainty, it's obviously kind of fluid when travel will you know, come back, when you can start building a lodge, when you can take it to the next uh, chapter. But I think that is a great uh, you know, point to end up on, you know, the positive future this area, you know, I'd love to see how, where we're going to be in five years and 10 years and 20 years. And thank you for joining us all the way from Kenya for staying up late. You know, it's time for either dinner or an after dinner drink or a sundowner. You kind of miss the sunset, but you know, it's never too late for a gin and tonic out there. Um, 
there's a couple of small questions. I'll try and answer them as well. And I'll send over the, the Q&A to you as well, Claudia, to answer some of those. So for everyone still on the webinar, thank you so much for joining us. You know, we really appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for letting us share a little bit about this magical part of Africa. And in the follow-up, you will also have Claudia's contacts and Lucas. And you know, so ask us any questions. You can reach out to me at any time. Anything we can do, if we can do a Zoom meeting with clients or a group planning to come and visit, you know, we, whatever we can do to help, just let us know. And with that, thank you so much and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye. You, Bye. Take care.